Okay, it looks like it's time to begin. Um, first of all, can people hear me okay? If you can hear me, raise your hand, say yes or no. Okay. Um, I want to start by making a few comments and then I'll start with and I'll go to questions and after that we'll go on to a lecture and again we'll end with questions. So let me change my screen here. And so during office hours before, I was helping some students out with some problems. And so I got some of the code and I was looking at it. And I made some changes and was running it. And at one point I noticed that my Python process was taking one 20 gigabytes of memory, 30 gigabytes of memory, um, which is way too much memory. So what I have here is, you know, some student code, and let's see, you know, so here we're just looking at um, opening up a zip, reading a zip file, zip file, and then getting a you know Python list, and then just a list of columns that they want to look at. Um, so far, so good. And then we got a for loop. Um, we're going through all the files in that zip file. Um, and then 
We're only going to look at the files ending in CSV, which worked for them, but didn't work for me because it's getting some files, um, some hidden F files, and and so that big as well. And the line I want to point out is right here. So they're reading each individual file, which you have to do, um, getting it PDF. Can you pause your stuff, please, while I try to figure out mine? Yeah, I can mute everyone. And so another problem becomes, so I got this one data frame, and now they're appending it to this list. And then when I've read all the files in the zip file, um, they're then going to concatenate them all into one big uh, data frame. The problem here is now that they've duplicated the data. Um, so we still have this list of all the data frames, individual data frames from each file and zip file. And we have um, you know, one big data frame by concatenating them all together. Uh, so we, we basically double the size of the memory we need. Now it turns out that we can just concatenate two data frames together and create a third one. And so we don't need to keep this of all other data frames. Um, and then I've got another example here. Um, another, pro another similar problem of, okay, we want to read, we're reading this um, HD F5 file using VEX, and then we want to convert it to a panda data frame. Um, now we go on and do a bunch of stuff, right? But both those data frames are still open, um, and we can't garbage collect them, and they're really only interested in looking at that data frame. So again, we've doubled the size of memory we, we actually need. So the one thing I want to point out you know, since we no longer need, right, that data frame, I want to release it so it can be garbage collected. And I can do that by assigning another value. So I just chose zero. Um, right? Then that data frame can be garbage collected and we're not consuming too much memory, which means we don't have, we're less likely to run up against the memory limit. Okay. So one point I want to make is right. The garbage collector cannot cut garbage and any memory until you release it. And what happened to me is I was playing. I ran the student's code, so that all that data was loaded. I wrote my own code and modified it and ran it using different variable names. So I'd accumulated lots of different um, versions of the data set in memory. Um, and it's very easy to do when you, um, you know, making a notebook and you're you're trying things out and you try it here, try something else there. Um, you want to be careful. Uh, next thing, um, so far when I've run PySpark in a notebook, I have not been able to make it use you know, multiple cores, which means it's running um, in a single thread. 
which doesn't really do us much good. Um, so for assignment two, you don't need to run it, run SpySpark. Okay, any questions? About what I've talked about or um, assignment two you might bring up? Why is it that you can, why is it that you can't uh, use more than one core in the Jupyter Notebook by curiosity? I haven't figured that out yet. Okay. Yes. Uh, professor, there's a, uh, there's a question in the chat that says, Yep. Um, are we not responsible for PySpark comparison now? That is correct. I just saw that in the chat, yes. Um, how did I know how many cores were being used? That was easy. I just um, ran a job which took several minutes and I watched my CPU utilities. And when I use multiple cores, my CPU utilage can go over 100%. Um, and since I've got six cores, I can easily go up to 600% um, utilage when I'm running something in parallel. Um, and when I was running PySpark in the notebook, um, I ran it for almost five minutes and it did not exceed 100% utilities. And I explicitly asked it to use six cores um, and the same thing happened. Okay, any more questions? Make this a little bigger. Okay, so I will um, go back to where we left off last time. And so I want to talk about decision trees. And again, most people who are taking a machine learning course know about them. Um, and so it'll be, I'll go too slow for you. And those of you who haven't, hopefully I won't go too fast. Um, this is, um, Example decision tree from the famous Titanic data set. Um, and the question is, the issue is um, you want to produce a model which shows the probability of dying. Um, given the data from, we know who died, we know their sex, we know their age. Um, and so the idea of a decision tree is, um, Using an existing, existing training data set, you want to ask a, a series of questions. Um, and so the first one here we're going to ask, all right? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's because done, 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 yes. So the first question they ask is, was it a male? Um, and basically, you know, 36% of the females survived, and that's just existing data. If they were male, then you ask how old were they? Um, and if they're older than a certain age, Basically, 61% died. Um, 
Why? Because they loaded all the bolts with the women and children first. Um, and, you know, so we have this series of question. you know, if they're male, yes, how old were they? Um, you know, if they're less than 9.5, well, is there anyone else in the family there with them? Then if the answer is yes, um, only 2% died. Um, so the goal of the session tree is you, we're going to build up this huge tree asking these questions on various properties um, and then use that as a model to look at other data. And and again, like all these algorithms, we'll find that um, the algorithms are already encoded for us, so we don't have to ask these questions, but it's interesting to understand, know how it decided. They want to ask the most important question first, um, and to do that, they use information theory. Um, and so they ask, you know, what's how much information is involved in a certain event. Um, and they measure that by you know, taking minus log of the probability of that event. And some of you may have heard of Shannon, who was a famous person in information theory, created the field. Um, if the probability of event is current at zero, then knowing it didn't happen gives us no information. If the probability of event is one, then knowing that information, knowing that it occurred, gives us no information. Um, now, if the probability of event occurring is 0.5, um, then that probability tells us thing, if we know what it happened, it tells us we will learn something. Um, and so basically, um, this equation gives us, when the probability is 0.5, I of E is, is one, and at the end it becomes zero. And here's a simple example. Um, the question is, you know, what you select a card from a deck of cards, um, and we, want, we then want to create a model of what type of card it's going to be. Um, so we know various things. So the probability of it being red, um, well, half the deck is red, so the probability is one half. Um, Pitch a card, meaning jack, queen, or king. Um, there's 12 of those, the probability is there were two. And so again, that formula gives us that information of being red is one. Information of picture is 2.12. Um, right, and again, we can do the thing for black. Um, again, this half the deck is black. And that picture is 10 to 13. So here's our values for information of those events. So we, come, we now come to entropy. is a measure of, depending upon the perspective, it's a measure of uncertainty uh, of, or disorder of information. Um, and the lower values of entropy indicate more order and less uncertainty. Um, and so now, right, entropy of being red or not red, um, well, it's probably being red times information of red, right? Same thing with not red. And so clearly we get one, which is good because um, we know that it has to be 
red or not. This one's a little more, more counterintuitive, um, but we get the entropy of picture or not picture being 0.78. Now to build our model, um, what the algorithm does is says, look, um, we can either ask, is it, was it a red car we picked up or the picture? And the question, what it looks at is which question is going to give us the biggest entropy loss. Um, so the algorithm looks at all, all your features, asks, you know, which feature is going to give us the biggest entropy loss initially? And that's the first question we'll ask. And, and then we'll repeat it in, in all the sub nodes. Um, using the algorithm, um, again, like I said, this built in you know, decision tree classifier. Um, again, we fit it to your data. Now you can use it on the data you're trying to study. And yes, again, we need, you know, basically everything we look at on Spark is going to want a SMV format for the machine learning. Um, and if, it's, if we've got categorical, um, variables, we need to convert them to integers. So looking at, you know, again, an overused example, um, measuring sepal and petal length of iris flowers on three different species. Um, need to actually read the file in. Um, and here I'm using the schema to make sure that each field is correctly typed. Um, so now the problem is, you know, species is categorical, but it's, it's not numeric. Um, And so I needed to create a categorical call with numeric. And so I used the string indexer to do that. Um, and so now uh, we're in a position to actually apply um, um, now we need to convert it to SVM format um, using the vector assembler. And right now we have our, our features. And as we talked about last time, we're going to use a pipeline and um, Right, so get my pipeline, get my indexer assembler, um, and now I can fit you know, iris and transform it and get, get our model, you know, get our, we have our data re ready, and now once we have the pipeline, we can use it to uh, read our training data, test data. Um, the training data to in the pipeline and look at our predictions. And you know, here's the output. All right, so we're using our feature to try and predict what species is going to be. And 
here's our label and here's our prediction and all the data we have here so far the prediction is pretty good Oops. Uh, yes, yeah, so I just I've got too many different screens going, so I have to remember to look up to admit more people. Now, if we actually want to see the tree and see which um, questions arise first, we, we can't get that to the pipeline. Um, so we can use the pipeline to, to transform the data. Um, right, and then transform it. And once we've done that, create our classifier uh, and fit the data to it. And we can start looking at, you know, which most important features. Um, we can also look at the, you know, by calling debug. Um, you know, the entire decision tree. Of course, now we have to go and look at what is feature two, what is feature two, what, which is the feature. Um, you know, if we come back, no, 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 wrong way, wrong way, wrong way. One more, no, one more. All right, so you know, two is the Tulsa versus color is zero, and right, Virginica is number one. All right, so we can now look at the various features that we're looking for and. You know, so literally a feature two is just, is below a certain size. That's all information they need. There's various things we can set. Um, Literally, the decision tree bends the data, um, looking at what's the most important. You know, if it's less than 2.45, so basically taking feature two and breaking it two different bins, one less than 2.45 and the greater than. Um, so if we knew to, we can, we can set the number of bins we want that we're going to use. Um, we can bin values beforehand. Um, and if we did, we have to convert all category features into um, numbers. You know, so here I'm specifying how many categories there are. And then, you know, one nice thing about decision trees is um, it's fairly quick to build and they're very fast to um, run. Um,
and we can make them We basically create a, you know, I consider forest, um, right? So we can get a bunch of, a bunch of decision trees, um, and then you know you use different sampling for each tree, and then the classification becomes majority vote. And here's an example. Um, like converting them to integral numbers, and getting the getting the right format. And, um, And yeah, I think this is not the example I want. There we go. Now I get import the random forest classifier. Um, that's why how many trees we want. And now we get three different decision trees. And the one interesting thing here is this particular um, row. Um, and basically, uh, we predicted the wrong value, um, which is somewhat understandable given that the data set was not very big. And we have to we divide it into the training set and um, um, the test set. The training set now gets divided into three more um, random sets by the algorithm. And so we don't have much data for each tree. Right? So we just don't have enough input. Okay. So our hyperparameters, um, you know, different ways to compute um, information gain. Um, how many bins we want to use for to discretize continuous features? How far, how deep should the tree be? Um, And then what's the minimum amount of information gain we can use to create a split? And of course, if we ask it to use lots and lots of bins, and we use all the trees very, very deep, um, and we allow uh, very small information gain to determine a split. Oops. Oops. Right, um, then it's possible the trees are so deep and we're, we're creating splits um, and I'm also information gain and we'll end up overfitting the data. So the nice things about the decision trees, you know, it's pretty easy to understand. Um, hopefully some of you understood my presentation about it. Um, and it's pretty, pretty easy to interpret because you can, you can print out the decision tree and say like, this, here's what it did, right? And ask this question first and you follow the tree down. Um, right? You can handle categorical features. Um, 
You don't have to worry about scaling features because each one is handled differently. Um, and they're actually pretty efficient to run. Any questions? I must say it's um, I'm taking some time to get used to talking to a bunch of people I can't see. Um, okay, so next topic. This article is getting old, but the terminology is caught on. Um, so this guy who, who was a director of AI at Tesla, wrote this article, um, you know, talking about what they consider software 2.0. Um, you know, machine learning is in that category, particularly in neural networks. Um, and, and software 1.0 is what we all know, you know, programming in various languages, Java, Python, you know, Scala, whatever. Um, but you know, training neural networks um, is a different type of beast. Um, and he claimed, well, it's not going to replace one dead old software, but it's going to um, take over, you know, large part of what software used to do. Um, You know, look, if you're, if you're trying to write code to recognize images, um, pretty much everyone does that with neural networks now, with machine learning. Um, speech recognition, um, you know, that was a big, big, um, actually, I think machine translation came first. Um, you know, linguists spent a lot of time building these huge complicated models, trying to understand the, the structure of a particular language. Um, so when you had a text in English, you could break it down into great detail and this huge structure. And then you can translate it to, you know, say French. And we have an equally complicated model of French. And now we can, French language. And so we can now use that to sort of translate back and forth. And then Google said, well, you know, we'll just go over to Stanford and basically create a PD PDF of every book in the library. And since they've got lots of books and lots of languages, we can use that text and say, look, you know, we've got 100 books in English and 100 books in French and same book. And so we can use those translation, we'll train, the machine learning model to convert English to French and they just killed everyone, right? And so everyone now does that. It's all done by, you know, neural networks. And there's some really nice features of, you know, of this. Um, basically, when you look at neural networks, at the very bottom, all you're doing is matrix multiplication, right? And looking at thresholds. So it's the basic alg algorithms are very simple algebraic operations. And you can bake that in, into silicon. Um, and then you have this huge data set coming in, you're doing it all in parallel. So it, 
you've got a better running time, not a huge variation of all. Oh, there's this one case that's going to be fast, and one case is going to be really slow. You know how much memory is going to use. It's highly portable. Um, and as Google proved, right, it's better than what the programmers are going to be able to do on their own. Um, and here's the fun part. Um, now, you know, with decision trees, we can look at it, right? And we can look at the tree and we can print it out and say, okay, here's, here's the entire tree. It's going to ask this question first and go down this route. And that's the next question. And so we can understand that. And if something goes wrong, we can look at it and say, well, okay, we didn't have enough data. We didn't put the data right. We should look like this or that. Well, neural networks, you have no idea why it does anything, right? Um, and there are lots of interesting cases where it can do odd things. Um, a few years ago, uh, Microsoft built this bot and they released it to the network, you know, on the internet, and a bunch of people got together and trained it to become a Nazi, right? Just, it was so obnoxious that Microsoft had to just take it down. Um, and Apple had this um, famous bug in their spell checking, which they were using autocorrecting, um, which everyone laughed at. But again, it was like no one could really understand why it was doing that. Um, so it makes it much harder to correct those type of things. And I probably don't need to tell this audience this, but uh, machine learning is everywhere. Um, so Apple has their ML kits. Um, and of course, it runs on their uh, laptops. But it also runs um, iOS. Right, and it even runs on their watches, right? So you can actually have a machine learning algorithm running on your watch. And it's unbelievably easy to use. Once you've got the model, all you have to do is you drag that model into Xcode and Xcode transforms that model into a single function call. Um, and you then there's a single function call to get the model and then there's a single function call to make a prediction and that's it. You know? It is scarily easy to do, to add it to an application. Scary because you don't need to know what should, what's going on um, to do it. And there are various studies. Um, so a few years ago, um, a company in you know, UC San Francisco, the medical school, um, actually used Apple Watches to train a learning algorithm. Um, and the amazing thing is they were able to detect um, people with sleep apnea. Um, with the Apple Watch, all, all it does is it measures your heartbeat. Um, they, they detected hypertension with 82% accuracy again just by um, measuring people's heart rate um, and of course detecting heart 
regular heart rhythms is much more accurate because that's what it was actually doing. Um, and of course, this is why almost every computer science student in the country wants to learn about machine learning and neural networks. Um, so literally, if you want to build an iOS application that contains machine learning, um, you first build a model using SkyKit Learn, and then Apple has software to convert it to the format for their machine learning kit. Um, Android uses TensorFlow, um, but again, you create a model and you add it to Android project. Yeah, let's, let's the last thing I want to say about this is all the high-end Android phones, all the iPhones for the last three, four years, I've lost track now, come with special purpose hardware just to run these machine learning algorithms. Um, and I forget how many cores, I think, yeah, quite a few cores runs in parallel. Um, most, you know, Amazon, Facebook, um, Google, um, and Microsoft now, most of their, most of their you know, cloud machines also have special purpose hardware to run machine learning algorithms. Well, Spark ML, we've looked at, you know, some of these. Um, and now, you know, we can export the Spark models. Um, so we can use them outside of Spark. So we can use Spark to actually tr train the data Look at the data, train the model, export it, and we can use it elsewhere. Um, yeah, and they use this predictive model markup language. Um, the better or worse, um, Spark is created when the XML phase, phase is still going on. Um, and then you have to worry about which, because when you export Spark, how do you import it to whatever code you're trying to run it in? And then you have to worry about what's compatible with what. So here's a URL, to look at that. So let's look at, we looked at k-means earlier. Um, all right, so we saw use k-means, we need to set the number of clusters. Um, and it's pretty, pretty straightforward these days again. Again, I'm using Spark, setting up, all right? Here I'm asking to use. Four local nodes, cores, um, again, reading the data, and set up a pipeline, um, process the data in the right format. All right, so now here's our, our pipeline. And here's the data it looks like so far. Um, I 
And now to do k means on it, well, you know, k means we have to specify how many possible they want. We want three. Um, we can then fit um, into our data. And then I'm asking to give me the centers and I print them out. And it gives me um, the cluster centers based upon you know, two dimensional data. Um, so we're getting X my coordinates. And then we can uh, make predictions. Um, of course, I did it. I cheated. Um, I should have broken you know, the data into training set and test set. Um, then we can look at you know the prediction. Um, And it did pretty good. Um, but again, the data set is relatively small. Now with Iris data set, you know, what we can do is we can actually plot it with two dimensional data, we can look at we could see the clusters and then we can and decide which clusters are where. Um, Sorry, I don't have a phone number for CS chairs. Who would you like to call? But the question is in general, how do we know how good the, cluster, the clusters are? Um, so one, um, One of several ways people have come up with trying to estimate how good a cluster is, is using silhouettes. And again, um, you know, all these things are programmed for us. So we can basically say, the you know, cluster evaluator, um, and evaluate on the predictions, give it a silhouette. And, you know, we get the numerical value, um, And again, some, some terms, how they define it. And it turns out that silhouettes are go from minus one to one. And if the value is close to one, it indicates that it's well within a cluster. Right. Um, this is that. I'm using an iPad to um, be able to draw on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, and the problem is, the serving, I expect if I tap on the right hand side of iPad, it should go to the next slide, and you might tap on the left side, I could go backwards, but tapping anywhere makes it always forward. So I can never swipe instead of tap. No, so that's not a bad value. It's a um, relatively good sign. Any questions so far? I have a question. Yeah. So if we had um, that type of distance, like return 
something like around zero, that would mean it's not classified by the cluster well? Right. Okay. So another topic, um, you know, when we think of equations, we think of one, two, three, four variables. Um, when we're looking at data sets, you know, basically each feature is another dimension. Um, and the problem is once we get very high dimensions, uh, the computations get, um, more complex, um, take much longer. Um, you know, if we're looking at a two dimensional space, so if I draw it here, and you know, here's our, you know, our data looks like something like this, and we're looking for a local, looking for an optimum value. Um, you know, we can start looking at various spots using various algorithms and then they start here and say, oh, we should go up, right? And so we'll go up here, we're not high enough. Um, but now we've reached a local, now we need to do something to get beyond this. But the search space is not too big. Um, now if we've got three dimensions, what we're looking at is a plane. And so there, our search space is much bigger. If you're in four dimensions, Right, our, our surface is not going to be a plane, it's going to be some three dimensional object, um, which each dimension has makes the search space. We're looking for some minimum or maximum value, much, much, I mean, orders make it bigger. And if you've got a hundred features, that's going to be a problem. Um, and so that's how more principal component analysis comes in. Um, and basically the idea is what? Well, that the, um, if you get a hundred dimensions, and maybe 70 of them don't add too much to the data itself. Um, and so principal component analysis will do that for us. Um, And again, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, create a PCA object. How many um, dimensions we want? Input columns, upper columns. We fit it to our data. Transform it. Um, and then it basically says, look, that first feature explains most of the data, most of the variation, and the other two, not very much. And the sum is not quite 100 because it's resting up how much it has, but there is interaction between the different ones. Um, Now, if I say I only want two dimensions or two features, um, well, I still get the same values, but I'm still explaining 97.76% you know, of the variation of the data. Um, And then we can literally um, transform the data um, using this. And we're basically taking, you know, three dimensional data on two dimensions or more. And so we're actually creating different. Let's, let's 
reducing the dimensional dimensionality of our space to make it easier to do the computations on it. And I must say, given my background, I find it scary that all these algorithms are so easily available um, and they're so easy to use without understanding how they work. Questions so far? Let's see if we got. Oh, neural networks. We could have um, you know, an entire course on neural networks. We could even have you know, a beginning semester course on neural networks and advanced course on neural networks. So we'll condense two semesters of coursework into a few slides. But check for it, right? Um, so here's an example. Um, again, made up data. You know, so I have Someone bought two apples, three oranges, and cost them five units. Um, went to another place and bought nine apples and four oranges, cost them 16. And then, you know, third store, someone bought four apples and eight oranges, and it cost them, you know, 10, 50. Um, so now we can ask, you know, You know, W baby the cost of an apple, and then number of apples, all right? W O cost of oranges, number of oranges, and then that might be some transaction fee. Um, that could be a sales tax. It could be intended to buy a bag. Um, so now. We compute the total cost um, in each one of these examples. Now we want to find the apple cost and the orange cost. And of course, if you remember, if you go back, you know, I used to have this in high school, linear algebra, and then we can create three simultaneous equations um, and then use them to solve it. Um, so here is a computational way to do it. Um, we can just guess um, and then say, oh, well, look, you know, the guess is too low. So let's guess again. Well, much better, we're closer. Um, so now we, we keep on iterating by changing these numbers a bit um, until we finally get closer and closer to the actual total cost. Um, so we iterate through over and over and over again, right? Um, until we get close enough and say, okay, these are the values we're going to use. And so to do this, we need to know how far off we are and some way of changing the weights rather than sort of bouncing around like I did. Um, so we want a loss. And again, we need 
we need terminology to make sure that no one outside of computer science knows what we're doing. Um, it's also loss function. Um, here's an example of a linear loss function. Um, You know, the activation function is a function we're trying to fit. Um, in our case, it's a you know, cost of, you know, the total cost of apples and oranges. Um, so, you know, we, we figured out that we call the, you know, the one multiply each integer variable by the weights and this constant we call the bias. Um, uh, You know, so another way of looking at this is I have, I have some function f of x, um, and I want to find, you know, the minimum point, the risk fixing point, um, find this slope, right? Um, and then we go to where it's zero point and evaluate um, there, and right, and then we evaluate here, take the slope again, right? And we're gonna we'll, we keep on going until we come across a zero. And so we now solve for the function on where it crosses the axis, right? So we keep on doing this over and over again. And once we do that, um, we get to more terminology. Um, gradient descent is basically that in, in higher dimensions. Um, we want to find where a particular um, function is, is zero or a minimum point. Um, and so again, you just pick a point, take n dimensional um, derivatives. Uh, and move along the slope to find the new point. And that gives us a systematic way to change weights. Um, we take the derivative of our equation function, get a gradient, um, and use that slope to adjust the two weights and keep on repeating over and over again. And then the problem is, if you do that here, we start here, right? We're going to get stuck up here. Or if we start here, we could get stuck down there, depending on what we're looking for minimum or maximum. All right. And then to avoid overshooting, um, we have to worry about you know, the learning rate. So we only go so far um, down the gradient. And so we get loss function, activation function, learning rate, weight, bias. Um, So our basic algorithm for null works is we select some random starting point, compute a loss function, um, find how far off we are, update the weights. Um, so I, you're taking the derivative, right? Get new values. Um, 
and keep on repeating this um, these two steps over and over again until we come up with answers which are errors small. And that is basically what a meal network is going to do. I'm looking at the time. So let me stop here to give you time to ask questions about the assignment. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. So um, I'm using the column filter suggestion that was on the wiki page. Right. And um, like I'm trying to reset my memory so I don't like keep rereading it in and causing issues with it that way. Yeah. Um, is there a way to make sure that it's reading in the right files? Because like I keep reading it in and then I'm getting like decimal numbers under my passenger count and I'm like, that's definitely not right. So like, I don't know how it's going like i don't know enough of the the conversion block to know how to actually assign um column names and stuff would you recommend just like reassigning them after the file is made after the hdf5 file is made well the biggest problem I see is um, there's so much data, we don't know if we're doing the right thing, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what I do in that case is I create a very small example. Um, maybe take two files out of that zip file, right? Um, and edit them so each file has maybe five rows or 10 rows, right? Um, and then if you're reading directly from the zip file, you can zip them back up again. Um, but then you, the data is small enough that when you look at the output, we can hand compute what the result should be. Right, and that way, um, you can know. Otherwise, it's like I ran the code this way and I got this answer. Is that right or wrong? I ran a different way and I got a slightly different answer. So, which way is right? Um, so, start looking, trying to create you know, a really small data set where you can compute what the answer should be um, and use that to validate your code. Does that answer your question? Give you some to work on? Yes, it does. Thank you. And Archana, you have a question? Uh, professor, uh, do we have to like uh, use a single HDF file for doing the tasks on Pandas desk and um, VAEX or are we supposed to like, can we create different HDF files for each of them? I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I'm on it. Talk about this early, I forgot. Um, so, in theory, it is possible to create a HTML5 file, say, using Panda and read it in VAX and vice versa. Um, the difficulty is, is that um, these HTML5 files have structure inside of them. And when you create them, you set that as structure. But the X and, and pandas have default structures which are different. Um, so for example, VX um, wants the data to be under the key called T. 
table. Mm -hmm. um, and then it wants um, the column headers to be under something called columns. And the pandas don't do that. So there's two different solutions you can use. Um, one is you can create separate HDF5 files, one for a panda and one for um, the AX. The other solution is you can use one of, you know, credit for one, uh, read it into, say, VAX, and then convert that data frame into a um, panda data frame. The problem with that second solution is you're at least temporarily going to require double the memory. You have to read it, the data frame in, in VIX, and then you convert that data frame into a data frame in the pandas. And at least initially, you'll have both data frames in memory. OK. Uh, so uh, so if we create different HDF files and then zip it up and uh, like submit it, will that be OK for you? Um, what I want you to do is I want you to have code to generate um, files in your notebook. The problem with zipping them up is um, the files are still big. Mm -hmm. Um, and that will cause problems in both uploading and downloading the, the assignment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Time for one more question. Okay, I think that's it for today then. Um, we will adjourn for now and meet again next week. Sir, did you, are you going to record this again? I, I forgot what you said about that. Um, this has been recorded and uploaded to, and you can, you can listen to it later. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah.